The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, my name is Kim Vasey, Gateway Foundation's Director of Marketing, and I'll be the moderator for today's one-hour training. On behalf of Gateway Foundation Alcohol and Drug Treatment, I'd like to welcome you to our co-occurring disorders webinar presented in honor of National Recovery Month. This is the second in a series of three free webinars Gateway Foundation is offering during September. I'd like to tell you just a little bit about Gateway Foundation. As the largest provider of substance abuse treatment in Illinois, we have 10 locations throughout the state, including two new locations, two new outpatient treatment centers, one in Pekin and one in Bloomingdale. Gateway offers outpatient, residential, and day treatment programs for both adults and adolescents. Now, I'd like to briefly walk you through a few housekeeping items. First, a quick review of the GoToWebinar controls. As you can see here, the control panel appears on the right side of your screen. This orange arrow lets you show or hide your toolbar. That's what you see right here. The hand icon also lets you participate throughout the presentation. And at certain points, the trainer, Nick Turner, may ask questions, and you can click this icon to participate. The hand icon can be found right here on your screen. There's also a question box where you can type in a question at any time throughout the presentation. You'll find that, that question toolbar right over here. Today's webinar will be conducted in listen-only mode to minimize any distractions or background noise. To confirm the audio is working, everyone please raise the hand raise the hand on your toolbar by clicking the icon that I just pointed out. Great. I can see a few people raising their hands, so that means they can hear me. That's always a good thing. The duration of today's co-occurring webinar, disorder webinar is scheduled for one hour, so all course material will be covered by shortly after 2 p.m. There will also be a Q&A session after the presentation where our trainer, Nick Turner, will answer questions submitted by attendees. Again, you can submit a question at any time during the presentation, and we'll address as many of those as possible at the end. Nick will also periodically ask a poll question. Poll questions will appear on the screen in place of the presentation, and we ask for your participation by selecting an answer and hitting the Submit button, so we may share the results with you during the webinar. Finally, at the conclusion of the webinar, we'll ask you to complete a brief survey to provide us with feedback on today's presentation. And a quick note for those of you looking to receive CEUs for today's presentation. In order to receive one CEU, you must access the webinar for one hour or more today. And it's really important to note that if you have a group of people in the room, only the person who is registered and logged into, the, into today's presentation will be provided the CEU. CEU certificates will be delivered to you within two weeks of today's presentation. At this time, I'd like to introduce our trainer, Mr. Nick Turner. Nick is the clinical supervisor at Gateway Foundation Alcohol and Drug Treatment in Aurora. He specializes in providing individual and group counseling for adults and adolescents with substance abuse and mental health problems. He's a licensed clinical social worker, certified alcohol and other drug abuse counselor, and a member of IADACA and the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers. He received his Master of Arts degree in Social Work from the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration. So now, give us just a second, and I'll turn the presentation over to Nick. We hope you enjoy today's presentation. Nick? Yep, I'm here. There we go. Great. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Treating Co-Occurring Mental Health and Substance Abuse Issues. Um, like Kim said, I'm Nick Turner. Um, my hope uh, is that you walk away uh, today with increased uh, knowledge um, and perspective on current trends in uh, the treatment of co-occurring mental health and substance abuse issues. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to walk away with a um, basic understanding um, and uh, treatment trends, evidence-based practices, things that are being used in the field in order to, uh, to be able to treat uh, co-occurring disorders. Um, part one of the training um, will be just a general background about mental health and substance abuse issues. Um, I'll use the, the term MISA um, for that. Um, treatment and maintenance is part two, so kind of treatment methods, things we're using at Gateway, but also in the field that are evidence-based uh, that help people uh, move forward with their lives. And uh, part three will uh, be questions and answers towards the end of the presentation. Um, so as a, as a general background, um, 
Co-occurring disorders is when someone uh, is referred to as duly diagnosed or having MISA-related issues. Uh, they have typically been diagnosed with a mental health disorder and a substance abuse uh, or dependence. Um, examples and ones we see are common in the field are generalized anxiety disorder and alcohol abuse or dependence, um, or major depressive disorder uh, and cocaine abuse or dependence. Um, but why, why I say typically is because sometimes in the medical field in general or um, social services, uh, um, sometimes few, uh, they use the term co-occurring disorders for also medical conditions, so co-occurring medical conditions uh, such as heart disease, diabetes, um, things of that nature. So, um, but for the purposes of this presentation, co-occurring disorders uh, will refer to mental health and substance abuse issues. Um, so we have our uh, first poll question. Um, just in general, to give me a good idea of, uh, of everyone out there and who, uh, the populations uh, you're working with, um, so I can kind of uh, cater um, uh, examples to those things. So children and adolescents, adults, or both? Well, Nick, it looks like the largest population uh, people work with. We have a 49% work with adults, and 21% work with children and adolescents, and 30% work with both. Okay. Thanks, Kim. Um, so there's an even amount. I'll, I'll try to give examples of both uh, with adults and adolescents. I've worked with both, and we treat both here at, uh, at, within the Gateway Foundation, so we'll be able to, uh, to speak to both. Thanks, Kim. Okay. So as far as a general overview of uh, with mental health issues, um, they vary in type and severity. Um, the ones we see most commonly in, in the substance abuse field um, or the most common ones are anxiety disorders, uh, which include generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, and uh, PTSD or you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, also mood disorders, the main ones uh, under that category are bipolar disorder and major depression. Um, there's the psychotic disorders, um, which is schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. Uh, and then personality disorder, a um, couple examples include borderline uh, personality disorder and antisocial uh, personality disorder. Um, it, mental health issues obviously can significantly decrease a person's quality of life and well-being. And the reality is that uh, they can temporarily be controlled or addressed by alcohol and other drugs. Um, our brains are kind of wired to, to search for short-term relief. Um, they believe it, it, it developed um, back in kind of when times were, were more basic, uh, when we were operating more on survival skills, um, you know, also known as like the fight or flight instinct, where we needed to live in the short term. We were always taking quick action to, uh, for relief. So if we ran into a bear, uh, we would run back to our shelter, and that would be you know, short term relief, instantly gratifying, instant relief from that, or kill the bear for food. Um, and then long term we would be fulfilled. But what it's turned into now is if we always seek short term relief for these uncomfortable feelings, it ends up exacerbating the problem where we're uncomfortable long term or even worse, it just be, it turns into full blown mental health issues. Um, and so when we'll talk about in treatment, the treatment part of the seminar today, uh, how to flip that switch to kind of be able to sit with, open up to the short term discomfort and then uh, long term be relieved and fulfilled. Okay, so substance abuse. So when someone's diagnosed with substance abu uh, abuse, it typically um, one or more of these things has happened in their previous 12 months of their lives. Um, so reoccurring legal issues, uh, risky behaviors, use in risky situations, um, failure to fulfill roles such as work or parenting, um, interpersonal conflicts, and they've never met uh, criterion for dependence, which we'll talk about next. Um, someone can never be diagnosed with like alcohol dependence and then go back to just alcohol abuse. Um, they can go into remission in alcohol de uh, dependence, but they can never um, then kind of go back in the diagnoses. Um, substance dependence is three or more of these things, the following things in the past 12 months. So tolerance, um, they have to use a substance more and more to get the same effect. Uh, withdrawal, um, when they discontinue the substance, they, feel, they experience a physical withdrawal. Um, they can't stop or slow down despite numerous attempts to do so. Um, using more and often more uh, more often than intended, um, and spending a significant amount of time getting the substance or getting over the use. So um, they're in, invested in a lot in finding the substance, or it takes them longer and longer to get over, like such a, like a hangover or uh, coming down, or you know, can, after they've used for a significant amount of time. Um, and all of these things are going to play into when we talk about treatment. I mean, they focus on different areas within these. 
um, two, different, two additional um, markers of uh, substance dependence um, include important recreational, occupational, and social activities are given up or no longer important. This is a very important indicator because um, treatment, with, especially with co-occurring disorders, is not just about not using drugs. Uh, it's about what's important to them, what are their values, what are their goals. What, you know, they spent a lot of time seeking the drug or spending time doing it or recovering from it, but what are you going to fill your time with now? What do you want your life to be about? So that, that's oftentimes more important than just teaching relapse prevention or ways not to use drugs. Um, and then the last category, continued use despite a physical or psychological problem uh, that are results are exacerbated by the substance. So that's co-occurring disorders. You know, they, they are, and whether it's physical, health, medical issue, or psychological. Okay. Um, with that said, um, in thinking about the development of co-occurring disorders and thinking about treatment, um, approaching it from a, what's called the biopsychosocial model. Um, so this involves uh, kind of the three different components, uh, one being um, social and environment, uh, which is um, the person's immediate surround. So some risk factors in that area include access to drugs, um, violence, danger, a sense of uncertainty, uh, people in the environment using uh, drugs or alcohol, and also at the same time, people around them that, are, that are, have untreated mental health issues. Um, and just in general, a broad one with environment is a lack of a sense of control. Um, if someone lives in an environment where everything is out of their control, they're really uneasy, things are unsafe, that's a very that's a huge risk factor for developing co-occurring disorder. Um, biology, which is genetics, um, that's the, the uh, genetic or family history of mental illness and substance abuse. Um, that's pretty straightforward with that one. And then psychology uh, is thoughts, emotions, um, which include mindset, self-image, worldview, and, and perspective. Um, someone could have a very kind of negative, um, very uh, rigid view of the world and themselves, uh, which can then increase their chances of engaging in substance abuse behaviors and uh, developing mental illness such as depression and uh, other disorders. Okay. So as far as treatment and maintenance, so moving co closer um, to talking about actually, you know, okay, people develop these things, but how do we treat them? Um, what does the evidence say? And how can I be effective? Um, collaborative and integrated treatment is really important. Um, and uh, it, it'll, it, it decreases barriers uh, for those uh, struggling with mental health and substance abuse issues. Um, you can think of it kind of a, or aim towards a one-stop shop model. Uh, ideally, a person can see a doctor psychiatrist and a counselor at the same location. Um, if that's not available, then at least having some um, referral sources. You know, you have the phone numbers, you have the address, you can hook them up right away with the appointment rather than just sort of um, being like, well, we don't deal with that and, and moving them along. Um, and de it decreases the chances they'll disengage due to issues like transportation and finances. If they can, you know, take one trip to one agency and get all those things, that's ideal. Obviously, this doesn't work always, but um, we can aim for that. Um, it also allows members of a treatment team to work together and communicate with one another. It's, that's really important, uh, especially with psychiatry, being able to, you know, the psychiatrist and counselors communicating uh, to express issues or concerns. Um, so that, the psychiatry and med uh, medical professionals, that really addresses the biology uh, part of it, so the, uh, the biopsychosocial model. Now as far as the, the psychology and sociology or environment, there are evidence-based interventions for co-occurring disorders. Um, this include therapy, group, individual, family, uh, and then outside of that, 12-step and peer support. And so we'll go into that now. Um, so the evidence-based interventions for co-occurring disorders that we're going to be talking about today are motivational interviewing, which uh, I'll, I'll talk specifics is how it works with um, co-occurring populations, uh, mindfulness-based interventions including acceptance and commitment therapy, and dialectical behavior therapy, uh, trauma-informed therapy, and then 12-step facilitation. Okay, so here's our uh, next poll question. So um, do you have any previous experience with or training in motivational interviewing? Well, Nick, by looking at the, the poll results, nearly 80% are responding yes. Okay, great. And this, uh, and thank you for your participation. This will allow me to kind of look for areas of the presentation that I need to focus more on than not. Um, so we'll um, we'll go into to motivation interview now. Thanks, Kim. Okay. Um, so uh, with uh, with motivational interviewing, um, 
Uh, it's a person-centered counseling style uh, for addressing the common problem of uh, ambivalence about change. Um, that definition was taken from the, uh, the new book. The, the third edition of the Motivational Interviewing book just came out, um, and I'll have it on the, on the suggested reading slide. So this is kind of a newer, um, newer definition of it, um, but it really gets to the heart of what motivational interviewing is. Um, and it, it's it really like any per anybody making a change uh, is ambivalent. They feel two ways about it. And naturally, if we as helpers take one part of that ambivalence, like the, the reasons to change, the person will naturally take the other end uh, and, and argue why they can't change. That's natural. It's called psychological resistance theory or reactance theory. Um, a person is not resistant on their own. Uh, they need something to resist against. There's it takes two to tango. Um, so if we, if we argue for one side of the change, people will uh, naturally argue for the, uh, the other end. So that can stop someone from moving towards a healthy behavioral change. Um, with motivational interviewing, spirit is prioritized over technique. Um, so the spirit including partnership, which is, means an active collaboration between experts. The clients are the, are the people we work with are experts on themselves. Um, we are on the, we meet them where they're at. We, this is a collaboration. It's not us being the expert and talking to them. Um, and am I the helper is the companion? We, uh, a good sign is if you're doing less than half the talking in the session, that's a great sign. Uh, and a nice metaphor to think about it is uh, motivational interviewing is about dancing and not wrestling. Um, it's, a, it's a dance. It's not a wrestle. If it's a wrestle or tug of war match, that's a sign to switch things up. Um, acceptance is affirmation. We're affirming strengths, uh, absolute worth. Uh, we're, we're like we're, we're acknowledging the person's inner worth and inner skills. We're respecting their autonomy. They are making the decision, not us. They may decide uh, on something that we feel is, is unhealthy for them, but that's their choice. Uh, they they have the, the autonomy to make that question or to make that decision. And accurate empathy, the ability to kind of be, put yourself in that person's shoes to try to understand them in a non-judgmental manner and reflect that to them. Um, compassion, uh, actively promote the other's welfare uh, to give priority, priority to the other person's needs. Um, and evocation, to call forth what is already there. So the, the, it's a strengths-based model uh, instead of a deficit model. Strengths-based meaning uh, that um, the their strengths are there. What, what they have inside of them is what counts, and it's already there. We don't need to give it to them. We just need to call it forth. Okay. So MI is uh, not a technique. You know, is it a treatment curriculum? Uh, MI is, is about being with clients. Clients motivation and retention and outcome vary with the particular counselor to whom they are assigned. Um, Counselor style strongly drives up client resistance. Confrontation drives it up, and empathic listening drives it uh, drives it down. Uh, the counselor is one; it's a huge determinant of client motivation and change. All right. So applications with MISA-related issues. So this is kind of specifically uh, about what the um, we're talking about today. And again, these are just common issues that uh, the people we work with are ambivalent about. This isn't so you aren't going to say, "I want my client to take this medication." Um, and I'm going to use motivational interviewing to get them to take it. That's not what we're talking about. It's a matter of helping them process both sides of the ambivalence, talk about it, and then make an informed decision that comes from them rather than um, you forcing it on them. So the treatment adherence is a huge one, medication adherence, um, attending support groups, um, and adopting new coping skills, especially with that. you know, Addressing issues of the past, talking about depression, anxiety, it, it tends to increase suffering at first. And, and people can be very ambivalent about going there. So having like creating the environment within the session to do that is really important. OK, so as far as recommended readings, with the limited scope of today's training, it's only an hour. Um, I've provided slides uh, for recommended readings for all of these, um, for all of the counseling styles we're talking about today. Uh, these are highly recommended readings, especially the first two here. So Motivational Interviewing, Preparing People for Change is the new book. It just came out on Gil from Guilford Press. Um, it's, uh, I'm currently reading through it now. It, it, it's great and kind of furthers um, the, the understanding of motivational interviewing. Uh, building motivational interviewing skills is, is a nice workbook for those trying to uh, learn and understand it. There's exercises that you can either copy and, uh, and do yourselves or write in the book. It, it's really great. It's easy to understand, straightforward. Um, and then the other two, motivational interviewing and treatment of psychological problems. It talks about MISA issues and how to use it within that population. Um, and then the, the last one is it, it's, um, it's 
a little, uh, it's from a few years ago, so it doesn't have the real up-to-date information like the third book has, but it, uh, the last one, this is a free resource through SAMHSA. Uh, you can uh, download it for free from the website and gives you a nice introduction to motiva motivational interviewing. Um, and that's tip 35. They have a whole series of tips um, that are, are free and, and uh, of great quality. Okay, so now moving on from motivational interviewing, um, our next poll question. Um, do you have previous experience with or training in mindfulness-based therapies? I think I launched the poll and it looks like we have about 60, high 60s, almost 70% of the people say no, um, around 30% of the people are saying yes. Okay, great. So we'll uh, we'll spend uh, a little bit more time giving examples and, and uh, explaining this uh, part of the session. So thanks, Kim. Okay, so um, mindfulness uh, for, comes from uh, Zen Buddhism, but as far as its use in Western cultures and in therapy now, uh, it's very secular, non-religious um, use of it. Um, and someone who brought it really to, to treatment, to medical issues, was John Kabat-Zinn. So I've included his definition here. Um, and mindfulness is the awareness that emerges through paying attention. That's an important one. So we're paying attention on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally to things as they are. Um, and breaking down that definition, it's, those are key components to living a mindful lifestyle and living mindfully. Um, quick example. Um, I'm sure a lot of you out there, you know, drive to work every day or drive to places pretty routinely. Um, and this is just, you don't have to answer this question, but I want you to think about when was the last time you remembered every, you know, a lot from point A to point B. Uh, oftentimes I'll make it to work and I'll be like, oh, did I even leave my apartment? You know, I, I don't, you don't remember anything in between because we're so lost in our head and we're so caught up in thinking and worrying about the past and worrying about the future that we miss the here and now. And that's, that's a huge thing of what mindfulness is, is being present, being aware. Um, you're non-judgmental. So what that means is less attached to your judgments. Uh, a lot of people get so caught up in, in judgmental thinking and shooting things down and that we, we miss what's actually there and what things could be. Um, and uh, they did some research with, with people, um, and they, they found that uh, people spend up to 50% of their day uh, in the past or worrying about the future that hasn't happened yet. And the higher that number got, the higher their, their, uh, the higher their suffering was and the uh, lower their life satisfaction was. And the lower that uh, number went, the more time they spent in the present moment, the higher their life satisfaction went. Um, so it, it speaks to the idea of paying attention, especially to things we often ignore or take for granted. Pay attention to things as they are at any given moment rather than how we would like them to be. Um, and it's very descriptive and objective in nature. So it's the antithesis of getting caught up in content and uh, uh, the content of thinking and judgmental and ruminative thoughts. Okay. Um, so the first mindfulness-based therapy we're going to talk about today is acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, it's part of the third wave of CBT. So in explaining in brief, uh, there's been three waves of CBT. The first wave was rational emotive uh, behavioral therapy, um, which is kind of, it's a style where, you know, you're, you're like looking at your thoughts and you're challenging them. You're, you're teaching someone to, to um, think more rationally. Um, second wave was Aaron Beck um, and talking about cognitive restructuring, thought stopping, the idea that thoughts happen followed by feelings and then uh, so on. And, and so, and then the third wave, it includes dialectical behavior therapy, mindfulness, or ACT, and um, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Uh, the main difference that sets them apart is their incorporation of mindfulness. And for the first two generations, or the first two waves of cognitive behavioral therapy was more like the, you know, focusing on the, what you're thinking uh, and, and the thoughts themselves and changing those or stopping them. And now the third wave is more focused on what we do with them. They don't view the thoughts or the feelings as the problem. It's more of how we respond to those things. Thinking is largely automatic. Um, you know, it's how we respond to it that makes the difference. Um, you know, a, a quick one right now. You know, for everyone to, who's listening and participating, I don't want you to think about chocolate cake. Don't think about chocolate cake. Don't think about the icing on the cake or the glass of milk you're going to have with it. What are you thinking about? 
be thinking about chocolate cake. We, if we try not to think about something, it elicits the thought that we're not trying to think of. So teaching, you know, what they're finding with this third wave beha uh, of cognitive behavioral therapies is that, again, if you teach someone to acknowledge the thought, respond to it, and let it go, it's much, it can be much, uh, a much healthier approach, especially for those who are severely depressed and anxious. There's some evidence out there that um, if te you know, teaching um, someone who's severely anxious or uh, severely depressed to challenge their thinking or the, the, to believe, you know, help them convince them that they're irrational, it makes them feel worse about themselves as opposed to feeling better or improving. Um, so uh, ACT is designed to increase psychological flexibility, so it helps expand lives and behavior patterns uh, while decreasing behaviors that tend to increase suffering in the long term. Um, so ACT helps pe people to compassionately embrace their internal experiences, uh, thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories, um, and build and strengthen behavior patterns that are value-oriented. So an example here would be uh, signing up for an adult education classes even when their mind is telling them that they are stupid and inca incapable. So they don't have to challenge the thought, they don't have to get caught up in the content of it and come up with every reason to change every reason, you know, they just have to be able to sort of acknowledge, it. oh, my mind is telling me that I'm stupid, my mind is telling me that I'm a loser, I'm, I'm not going to not gonna be able to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway, I'm going to see what happens. It's less caught up in the content and pairing action with values and goals. And we'll talk about that more in a second. All right, so the, as far as the ACT model of pathology and suffering, so their view of how pathology and suffering, how it starts. Uh, the first one meaning, uh, being experiential avoidance. Um, so again, what I, what I referenced earlier with back in primitive times, we needed to avoid situations that made us feel uncomfortable. We wouldn't go into uh, an area where we saw a lion before um, because we knew, okay, that's life-threatening. So I'm going to avoid that and feel good and, and live to see another day. We are the ancestors of those people who, who avoided tense situations and survived. But now what happens is people apply this to things like asking someone out on a date, going back to school, approaching trauma, past experiences, and we, try, we, we act, are actively engaged in, in avoiding those things. And in the short term, it feels good because we avoid doing it, but in the long term, it feels worse and we don't address it and it takes us further and further away from our values and goals. Um, so that's where it starts, and it, this, this is a behavior pattern that's learned over time, but also instinctual, so it, it, it drives someone's life and it can really limit them. Next is fusion, so the idea that we fuse with everything that goes through our mind. We fuse with the content, we fuse with the feeling, we become the depression, we become the loser that our mind tells us we are, and we act accordingly. Um, again, there's that rigid sense of self. Um, this plays into diagnoses. Oh, I'm just uh, an alcoholic and we're so fused with that, or I'm, just, I'm bipolar. And, and we, we fuse with that, it doesn't leave room for improvement. It doesn't acknowledge you're also a father, a son, a coworker, a musician. It doesn't acknowledge all those other things, and we become so fused with those identities, then it results in the next inaction, impulsivity, avoidance. We continue to engage in behaviors that distance ourselves from our values. Um, what we truly care about, because values, like oftentimes, if you, you start a value conversation about values with anybody, it, it, people get tearful and people get emotional because they're very close. It's, it's what means the most to us in life, and that's hard. And you know, it's it's hard things to face, and we instinctually can kind of avoid those things, which causes more suffering, um, and that also results in lack of self knowledge, and attachment to the past and the feared future. Things won't change. Things are just going to be the same. I can't change it. If someone's so fused or attached to that idea, nothing does change. It's just we relive the past over and over again. Okay, so psychological flexibility. So where we're moving, helping the clients get to um, that sense of acceptance. So it's not re resignation. It's not laying down and sort of saying, yeah, well, I accept things how they are and they don't have to change. It's more of a willingness. Um, there's a phrase they use in ACT. If you aren't willing to have it, you've got it. If I'm not, you know, Part of the, one of the number one reasons why people have a panic attack is because they try not to have a panic attack. Um, so with acceptance, you learning to sit with uncomfortable feelings, open and difficult experiences, and opening up to it. And okay, I may not want to have you, but I'm going to allow you to be there. Um, so developing that mindset, diffusion. So diffusion is a skill set that you can teach people. Um, so an example, I'll give an example of what we do with our clients at Gateway. Um, with adolescents and adults, they love this exercise. Um, they give their addiction a name. 
um, and, and you, you, they list the traits of the addiction. They, they sort of like divide and they draw a cartoon of it. And then they sort of, we had a client uh, a few weeks ago name his addiction Queen Cocaine. And he drew this you know, picture of a stick figure with a crown and a crack pipe. And um, we, t we talked about, you know, it's a skill where you can sort of say when, when he's having using thoughts, it's not him choosing to have those using thoughts. He can sort of say, oh, there's Queen Cocaine calling my name again. I don't need to listen to Queen Cocaine anymore. So it's not challenging. It's kind of a comical, funny way of just like not giving the thoughts power, and they defuse from the thoughts instead of fusing with "I want to get high." They're sort of saying, "Oh, there's the addiction again. There's queen cocaine calling my name," and it, it decreases the, the the fusion with the thought and allows them to behave in a way that is in line with their values and goals. They have the thought. They're not getting rid of it. All they're simply doing is responding in a different way. They're developing an observing sense of self, um, which you can use metaphors to help develop this. So one we use commonly is one, uh, you know, being the chessboard instead of the pieces. The chessboard holds the pieces, but it's not engaged in the war. It's not engaged in competition. It's not trying to defeat anything. You can say that the pieces are the thoughts, the feelings, but they're the board. They hold them, but they are not their feelings. They are not their thoughts. Um, same thing with the house. They can be the frame of the house, and the contents of the house is not them, but they can hold those things and still uh, be strong. Mindfulness, we've talked about. Um, you know, um, part of mindfulness can be meditation, but it doesn't have to be. Um, we, we, we do meditate with our clients and our groups and teach them how to do mindfulness meditations, which is simply, you know, at the very basic level, observing breath, observing body. And if your mind gets caught up in thinking or feeling, you know, just you know, acknowledge it, but bring it back to the breath. Um, contact with values, so doing values work, helping people define what they want their lives to be, to be about, answer the question like, if you were the person you wanted to be, how would you, be, how would you act? You know, what are those values? What, are the, what do you want uh, your life to be about? Workable goals, being able to sort of just, my, not, not having a goal be, uh, be I, just, I don't want to use drugs, um, but the goal be, you know, I want to go back to school and have my bachelor's degree by this time next year. Or I want to um, ask uh, the, my, one of my friends um, to go to a movie this weekend. You know, workable, measurable goals that work towards the, their larger life goals. And then committed action, you know, being able to sort of act first within your values and goals and let your thoughts, feelings, and beliefs catch up to you. Being able to sort of say, I am committed uh, to doing this and I'm going to do it even when I don't feel like it. Um, so recommended readings, um, these are all very strong books. Um, uh, but the, uh, if you're looking for uh, ones that are easy reads and that are quick, that give you a great understanding of ACT, uh, the two on here are The Happiness Trap by Russ Harris and the great title of Things Might Go Terribly, Horribly Wrong uh, by Kelly Wilson. They're not necessarily focused on uh, mental health and substance abuse issues, but it, it gets into both um, and, and gives you a great understanding of ACT. Um, and those other ones are great too. Mindfulness for Two, Learning Act, and Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, The Process and Practice of Mindful Change. Those are all strong reads. And, um, and again, I apologize that we can't go more into depth uh, with a lot of these, uh, but it will allow you to kind of take the, take the ball and run with it if you have an interest in this. Okay, so going into, um, we're going to talk about DBT now. Um, so dialectical behavior therapy applies a range of cognitive behavioral therapy strategies to helping those with borderline personality uh, disorder traits, including suicidal behaviors. So this gets at the access to uh, component. We, we do uh, see uh, BPD uh, within, you know, people with BPD traits um, at Gateway and I'm sure in the field as well. It's a pervasive pattern of instability uh, of interpersonal relationships, uh, self-image and affects, um, as well as marked impulsivity. Uh, that begins uh, by early adulthood and is present in a variety of contexts. Um, so as far as the identifying characteristics in the, from the DSM, um, there's a, it can be uh, coupled with extreme fear of uh, abandonment, uh, unstable and intense interpersonal relationships, um, identity disturbance, uh, unhealthy impulsivity, uh, recurrent suicidal behaviors, gestures, threats, or self-mutilating. Uh, affect instability, uh, which is like their emotions up and down. There's no consistency in, in feeling, uh, chronic feelings of emptiness, like there's something missing in their lives. Um, intense anger uh, that's not necessarily um, triggered by anything. It's just it's a general sense of anger and intensity. Um, transient and stress-related paranoid ideation. So a lot of paranoid thinking, sort of having that mindset, everyone is out to get me. 
um, and dissociative symptoms, so you know, the, like stepping outside of their body or stepping outside and just feeling as if they're detached uh, and detached from reality. Um, so as far as the format, uh, it's really it's difficult, um, not impossible, it's difficult to be um, a full DBT program. Uh, it, it's pretty intense, it's closed group, um, lengthy, um, and involves individual group and peer consultation components. Um, peer consultation meaning a study group uh, among professionals, talking about cases, staffing them. Um, so what's common in the field, or what at least what I've found, are uh, DBT skills groups, um, which is you know, some of what we run in, in Gateway and uh, we've seen in the field. Um, group and individual skills training. So you're taking some of the modules within that we'll talk about in the main component section, um, and you're teaching that to clients and working through the skills and group, which can be useful. And it also, I found that DBT kind of transcends borderline personality disorder traits. Uh, a lot, most people can benefit from learning the DBT skills. Um, and it, it can be highly effective no matter what. You don't have to have specific to borderline personality disorder groups. Um, so the main components, and this is just, a, again, a broad overview of DBT. I'll include some readings later um, that will allow you, if you feel, to, to dive deeper and to learn more. Um, so the main components um, include um, core mindfulness skills, so teaching people how to observe, how to describe their experience, how to participate in it, rather than being kind of uh, on the sidelines or isolating. Um, being able to attend to events, emotions, and other behavioral uh, responses without trying to terminate them when painful or prolong them when present. So really getting, finding a middle ground, being able to sort of open up to experience and not try to like make happy even better and not try to make sad, uh, not try to get rid of sad and end up feeling worse. Um, and be able to describe experience with words without kind of just getting caught up in emotion and content and shutting down. Um, so uh, an example is I am afraid. Uh, being able to recognize that is okay. There's, you might feel afraid, but that doesn't mean you're in a life-threatening situation. Um, how can you be effective in that situation? Which brings to the point of uh, one of the main points in D that's made in DBT is being right is less important than being effective. So being able to act effectively in any type of situation. Then there's um, emotion regulation. Um, with uh, So those with um, DBT traits often uh, are emotionally intense and experience mood swings. Uh, anger, frustration, depression, anxiety, uh, which is so overwhelming. It's such a like a messy kind of soup of emotion. Uh, it hinders them from achieving goals and behaving in a way that is aligned with how they want to be. Um, so with emotion regulation, we're teaching and identifying and labeling emotions, identifying obstacles that lead them to becoming stuck, reducing vulnerability um, to what they call emotional mind. So in DBT, like it's it's uh, it's talking about uh, extremes and then aiming for the middle. Um, and with, so there's, um, there's the emotional mind, there's the rational mind, and we're aiming for the middle, which is wise mind. And that's more of a mindful perspective that incorporates thinking and intellectual abilities with also feeling. Um, next is interpersonal effectiveness, um, which is uh, teaching effective strategies for asking for what one needs, saying no, and coping with interpersonal conflict. So this is common for uh, things like uh, social skills training, um, so obtaining uh, changes you want, maintaining the relationship with the person while doing it, while also maintaining self-respect. These can be really uh, effective groups, especially with uh, co-occurring disorders, because um, it can teach things like refusal skills being, and being able to sort of stand up for yourself and, and your needs. Just because you're in recovery and you've made some mistakes does not mean you're not a person and does not mean that you don't deserve respect and to be heard. Um, a lot of people come into treatment, whether with BPD traits or not, and they feel disempowered. They, they have family members that are hurt and, and treat them with disrespect or, or too much um, structure and too much um, care, and that you know, can hinder the relationship. So it, these groups can be very powerful in, in helping them along and be able to stand, stand up for themselves and maintain self-respect. And then last, uh, distress tolerance. So opening up to and coping with painful experiences. Uh, pain and distress are part of life. Uh, they cannot be entirely avoided. Um, uh, so in our attempts to avoid pain often cause more pain. Uh, so distress comes with change. You know, people are making changes in their lives and that usually re relates, uh, usually brings about distress. Um, so learning how to tolerate that, uh, one can move towards positive life changes. Um, you know, being able to perceive, uh, you know, opening up to their environment, observe their thoughts and action patterns and be able to move through that. 
uh, instead of kind of shutting down, especially during this, a lot of uh, the stress tolerance works on crisis management. Um, so instead of like, you know, getting caught up in this can't be happening, I can't deal with this, kind of being able to develop the mindset of this is happening, I'm uh, not happy about it, uh, but how uh, can I be effective in this moment? Um, and that, that's a really important thing to look at because a lot of people get caught up um, in, in that I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, and, and they, they shut down. Um, and temporarily that might work out, but long term it doesn't help them like, kind of move on with their lives. Um, so the, there's three books listed here. All, um, they're all great. And, um, the first one is the skills training. So if you're looking to do a skills book or skills um, skills group, the first book is is, is uh, can be great. Um, the second one is a little bit more in depth um, and it, like definitely goes more into theory and the background. Um, and then uh, the third one kind of spreads that that out to like looking at how can you apply DBT to other disorders, not just uh, BPD. Okay, so uh, moving on, uh, any, so the next poll question. Um, any experience with or training in trauma-informed therapies? Well, Nick, it looks like people are still voting, but about 70% are saying no, but 30% are saying yes. Okay, great. Thanks, Kim. Okay, so um, with trauma-informed therapy, so um, many individuals seeking behavioral health treatment have a history of experiencing trauma, whether it's physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, violence, et cetera. Um, those with trauma histories often develop co-occurring disorders, uh, including substance abuse, mental health, and chronic medical conditions. Um, as far as uh, being diagnosed with PTSD uh, as far as the DSM, so these these criteria. Uh, so the first one is a stressor, um, and uh, you know the person has exp been exposed to a traumatic event, um, and or tr you know either exposed through witnessing or actually feeling it, them uh, experiencing it themselves, um, and uh, the being so they experience that stressor. So there's an the intrusive recollection which is uh, recurrent images, thoughts, or perceptions um, in young children and come out as repetitive play, like reenacting the trauma. Um, also in dreams, uh, acting or feeling as if the trauma is reoccurring through flashbacks, hallucinations, things of that nature. Um, and feelings just of intense psychological distress uh, and, and exposure to, um, to triggers, things that they are related to the trauma. Even though it's not happening, they feel as if it is. That's criterion B. Uh, C, so avoidant and numbing um, is efforts to avoid thoughts, feelings, conversations about it, efforts to avoid activities that could rem, uh, remind them of it. Uh, so like a shutdown almost, an inability to recall the information can happen, um, feeling of detachment, restricted range of affect, um, and sense of the future is not, not going to happen. The future is, is, is not going to happen because in kind of a, the resignation that things are over. Uh, Hyperarousal, so difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, irritability, difficulty concentrating, hypervigilance, uh, exaggerated startle response. Um, the duration is just as far as the um, how long it's lasted, um, and then the functional significance. So the, um, the, there's a significant impairment due to the symptoms and their response to them. Okay, so in taking a trauma-informed approach to treatment, an organization takes steps on all levels to gain a basic understanding of how trauma can impact the life of those seeking services. So adjustments are made accordingly in order to increase the effectiveness of the program and avoid re-traumatization. Um, those are a lot of like so like uh, specific examples um, informing staff on all levels about physical boundaries. So clients are, are informed that you have the right to say no to hugs. And staff are informed that if hugging can re-traumatize uh, someone, can be uh, uh, overriding someone's boundary, and you need to be aware of that. Not just hugging, too, just physical space when having a conversation, coming up behind someone, knowing that that could cause a startle response or a, a very highly negative response and re-traumatize someone who's experienced trauma before. Uh, Trauma-informed care and treatment aim to address issues related to experience trauma and facilitate healing. So key issues to consider, uh, the client uh, needs to be respected, informed, and connected and supported, uh, healing and recovery, especially you know, informed and respected, um, 
in traumatic events, a lot of what ca causes the problems is a person, it, their control is totally taken from them. And if in a treatment environment we're strict, rigid, take control and are, are controlling everything, that can re-traumatize someone who's, who feels powerless. It's not empowering, so it needs to be. Uh, the relationship between trauma and symptoms of trauma are understood. And collaborating with a client, uh, support members, medical professionals, and other behavioral health agencies. As we talked about earlier, uh, trauma can be a very complicated issue to treat. And if everyone can be on the same page, it increases a chance, uh, person's chances of succeeding. Um, so a case example um, of working with someone with, uh, with trauma. So uh, I recently was working with a 35-year-old male, um, new father and husband very successful in his field, uh, but his, his productivity at work and in life was, uh, had decreased over the past year, and it started when he found out his wife was pregnant. Um, he has a history of sexual abuse and trauma. He was uh, sexually abused by a member of his family, um, and he had issues with becoming a parent, and he had issues with, um, that stemmed from uh, the sexual abuse and trauma he experienced as a young kid in the foster care system um, and being sexually abused. Um, he was diagnosed with alcohol dependence and PTSD. He's drinking daily from uh, the previous 12 months. Um, issues in behavior uh, resulted in worsened depression, anxiety, and decreased intim intimacy. Um, for a long time, he, he kind of he would refer to himself as a sex addict. He would uh, have be intimate with women and just kind of uh, toss them aside and not have any feeling. And then when he met his wife, it, w it became increasingly hard to be intimate because intimacy was always the thing he, he was in control of. You know, when he was the person uh, kind of casting people aside, he was in control versus now that it's a mutual relationship and that was very uncomfortable with him. So whenever he would get close to even just being physically uh, affectionate with his wife, he would shut down. Uh, he would get angry and he, he would get frustrated and numb and just detach, um, which was causing issues in their marriage. Um, so in working with him, I, I, I emphasized a sense of control, a sense of being he could come to me and we could process and he could trust me. Um, he could open up, and, and he had the control in the sessions. You know, what he wanted to work on was what we, uh, where we went. Um, and I also worked on with him in mindfulness skills, being able to meditate, stay in the present moment, um, turn towards his uncomfortable feelings, process the trauma. And um, through that, taking that acceptance and commitment therapy approach and, and, and like, taking into consideration his boundaries, um, his intimacy with his wife improved. He was, they were able to be intimate and, and, and find worth in that. And he uh, returned to work, has been uh, is now three months sober, um, and is doing really well. And, and being able to practice those principles allowed uh, room for healing. Um, so a couple suggested readings, uh, Helping Women Recover by Stephanie Covington. Um, it's, uh, and Helping Men Recover by Stephanie Covington and Beyond Trauma. Um, she's a highly regarded researcher and clinician in the field. Um, she very much advocates for gender-specific treatment of trauma. Um, and uh, there are specific uh, issues that we can't go into today, unfortunately, but that relate to trauma with, uh, with gender. Uh, Seeking Safety is a curriculum. Um, and it, it, uh, it, the cognitive behavioral curriculum more in the second wave uh, of CBT, um, but it can be used to help uh, facilitate group counseling for men and women. Um, and then the last one is a, an ACT book with, uh, that's uh, very well done that has some treatment session examples and interventions for trauma, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy for treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma-related problems. Um, additional examples include eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Um, again, for the scope of this training today, we, we can go into it. But if you want specific information, uh, the Francine Shapiro's website has some great resources, some referral re uh, resources for EMDR. And that's listed on there, emdr.com. And then prolonged exposure therapy for PTSD relates to kind of the traditional exposure therapy, but um, it's evidence-based and, and it's uh, highly effective. Okay, so our last uh, last section for today, uh, we have one more poll question. Do you have any previous experience with and or training in 12-step facilitation? Nick, I want to use your poll. About 80% of our attendees today have voted. It looks like it's pretty close. 47% of those have said yes. 53% have said no. Okay, great. Thank you, Kim. All right, so 12-step facilitation. So facilitating peer support group attendance uh, for those with co-occurring disorders can be challenging. 
uh, barriers can include lack of knowledge and information, um, stigma related to mental health issues and medications, um, symptoms and transportation and resources. In my work with clients, the biggest barrier, I think sometimes they go uh, to there are a couple things. They, they'll go to a meeting, and if they're, if they're symptomatic, if they're highly anxious, or if they're depressed and withdrawn, or if they're psych, experiencing psychotic symptoms, um, they're, they, some meetings, and not all, and that's why we'll talk about this, uh, they, the, the person perceives themselves as being rejected or, or judged. Um, and also, at the same time, a lot of you know, what comes um, with co-occurring disorders is there's medications. And um, depending on the meeting they go to, if some um, the newer literature in AA and NA and the, and the 12 steps encourages people to take medication that, that's prescribed to them or as prescribed. But if someone has kind of an older school mindset and is uninformed about co-occurring disorders, they can um, kind of be critical of the person for taking their medication. So it's important to work with them through this. And we'll, we'll talk about that as, as we uh, go further in. Uh, so there's benefits of peer support. You can, they can get support and fellowship, structure and routine, and accountability and guidance outside of group or outside of the therapy uh, environment. Examples of MISA-informed 12-step uh, groups include Dual Recovery Anonymous and Alcohol Anonymous Double Trouble meetings. Um, so you can look those up specifically online and refer your clients to them. And then additional, there's non-12-step support meetings uh, through NAMI, uh, which is a great organization. Um, you can, there's schizophrenia support groups, bipolar support groups, depression, anxiety across the board. So as far as the 12-step facilitation within a treatment program, um, there's, you can kind of take a tiered approach. Um, with individual, obviously, we already talked about motivational interviewing. This is a 12-step attendance can be a very something that someone's very ambivalent about. So creating an environment where they can process both sides, kind of talk about it in a non-judgmental way, increases their chances of engaging. But again, we're not enforcing that on them. We're merely exploring the, the option. And then group and individual. So um, as far as Hazelden's co-occurring disorder program, it's a it's a it's a great uh, curriculum that allows you to take. There's a, there's CBT components, there's family components, and there's also a 12-step facilitation component, which helps them helps the group members, uh, the people dealing with those issues, explore um, issues related to 12-step attendance and possible benefits. And then 12-step facilitation therapy is an actual evidence-based curriculum, or both of those are evidence-based programs. Um, but 12-step facilitation is an um, evidence-based curriculum um, that features sessions on you know, open exploration of the 12 steps and what, what meetings look like and how to find good meetings and characteristics of a sponsor and how to get active. And it, it really helps uh, the people we work with kind of explore the issues before they actually go or, or during. It, it can, that can help as well. Um, so as far as like evidence-based things for parents and support members, um, there's craft, which I highly recommend. Um, I refer all, I give all my parent, uh, the parents we work with, I recommend this. Um, the book for them is Get Your Loved One Sober, and then there's a subtitle, Alternatives to Nagging, Pleading, and Threatening. What it does, it, it, it pretty much teaches family members motivational interviewing. It teaches an assertiveness skills, how to set good boundaries, but not nag, not plead. Um, and and the, the book to refer them to is Get Your Loved One Sober. The, one, the book for that uh, for therapists or helping professionals is motivating substance abusers to enter treatment. Uh, Myers and Wolf. They both talk about how they don't like that title because it sounds leading. It's, it's kind of misleading, it, but it's taking an approach of how how do you kind of uh, work with family um, to create a healthier environment uh, when dealing with uh, mainly substance abuse issues, but also MISA issues. Um, Education, uh, National Institute of Drug Abuse, drugabuse.gov is great. Uh, has great information on drugs and co-occurring disorders. Um, Al-Anon for, for uh, family members, and then Recover Gateway is, so that's our website, um, to be able to get more information on that. And I think we're at a good place for questions. Thanks, Nick. We've concluded our one-hour training session for today. If you're logging off now due to time constraints, please take a few minutes to fill out the survey at the end um, after you log off. Um, also, be on the lookout for an email. We'll send you a link to the video recording of today's presentation, as well as a PDF um, that includes all of the recommended readings I know a lot of people were asking about. So thank you again. We're getting ready to take a few question and answers, uh, do a short question and answer session with Nick. Um, so Nick, what types of questions do we have for today? OK. So um, someone asked, can 
occurring disorders include access to disorders, and that's correct. It can. Um, um, it looks like we have a question, Nick. Can I please, okay. someone ask again, can I please get the readings and motivational interviewing? And just to let people know, we will send out an email that has a link uh, to today's presentation, a recording, and a PDF for you. Okay. I had the questions up, and then uh, they disappeared, Kim. Sorry. No problem. Here we go. I've got one for you. So when when doing the diffusion, it's basically letting the client know their addiction is not who they are. That's from, from Kedra? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, well, exactly. It's, it's sort of letting them know that, that uh, they are not their addiction, but it's also kind of helping them separate themselves from the addiction, having more of a, like an observing sense of self where they can kind of see, they whole, wear a whole bunch of hats rather than just one. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's exactly right. Thanks, Nick. We have another question. Can co-occurring disorders include access to disorders? Uh, yeah, and that's, that is correct. So access to disorders are included in, in the, the category of co-occurring. Okay, I have another one for you from Ava. What is double trouble meeting? Uh, double trouble meeting is is is, um, is a form of an AA meeting where they talk about both um, mental health and substance abuse issues. So double trouble meaning they have um, that's their frame of two two problems, so two troubles: the mental health and substance abuse. So um, when when looking up AA websites or AA meetings, um, it'll say types of meetings. So there's speaker meetings. There's um, uh, fellowship meetings, they'll, it'll actually say, like, the title will be Double Trouble. Okay, great. We have a question from Isaac. He wants to know if it's healthy for teenagers to attend adult state 12 step meetings while in treatment, especially dealing teens dealing with co-occurring disorders. In my experience, it could go both ways. Some, if it's in like a, a meeting that's informed about uh, mental health issues and they have um, people who are chairing the meeting, uh, that are open and flexible, then it could be, you know, it, it's been, I've had good experiences, but um, I've also seen it fail where uh, uh, especially young people feel judged, they feel out of place, and then they're much less willing to participate in the 12 steps. So if you have leads in the area as far as good meetings and ones that are open, you can, you can try it out by referring them to. Otherwise, I would say stick to referring to them to young person's meetings. Great. It looks like Kendra has another good question. How would you decide which therapy would work best for what client, or are there situations when all therapies are used together? Um, I think there are situations when all therapies are used together. Sometimes they can kind of contradict each other a little bit. Um, I like in, in my practice, what we're trying to aim for is moving more towards the third wave of cognitive behavioral therapies. But um, what the evidence kind of shows out there, as far as the research between them. ACT and the mindfulness-based interventions tend to work uh, for clients who are on the kind of more severe end of the scale with severe anxiety, severe depression, have uh, been kind of caught up in it for a long time, uh, same with addiction issues. Um, and, and so like th those who kind of um, display those characteristics, it, the mindfulness-based interventions tend to work better for. Okay, we have another question. Someone is indicating that they work with teenagers. And they're asking if it's very hard to treat teenagers that have co-occurring disorders. Um, it can be. We, we're experiencing that uh, the 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 adolescent program at Gateway Aurora is kind of newer, and we're we're kind of working on these issues right now. Um, the the focus it has to be on kind of distilling things down, being able to aim at teaching one or two skills a session. Uh, and, and, and engagement in creating that environment where change could happen, non-judgmental but structured um, behavior modification, uh, but in a fun, open manner, uh, rather than like being too intense with with uh, intervention. Um, so being able to make it fun, but also break it down and keep it simple. Uh, but it can be challenging because with so many issues within the room, and um, the the young young persons can act out, and that, that can make treatment hard. Okay, we have a question from Erin. She's asking if you can give an example of a motivational interviewing statement to try with a client who's resistant to starting medication for the first time. Okay, yeah, so um, so how I would approach that. So somebody says, you know what, the doctor wants me to take medication. I, I decided really, I, I don't know if I want to. Um, you would explore both sides of the ambivalence. So you could say, okay, um, so what, what are your, some of your concerns about the medications? Let's talk about that. And then they express their concerns. You use empathic listening, reflective statements to kind of talk about that. 
And they say, okay, well, we've talked about that, and you summarize the, the, their concerns, and they say, could you see, uh, or what would be some of the benefits to taking medication? And then you kind of explore that, and then you give a big summary statement and sort of say, well, you know, this seems like a hard decision for you to make. You know, what do you, what do you think about it? And, and so you kind of keep them exploring both sides of the ambivalence. So it's those two, those two questions. What are some of your concerns? And then also, what, what do you see as the perceived benefits and helping, and then emphasizing autonomy, being able to say, well, you don't need to make a decision today. We've explored both sides. Go forth, and you know, it's up to you. We'll, we'll uh, call me tomorrow and uh, tell me about what you think. Thanks, Nick. We have a question from Keith. He's wondering what suggestions you might have to deal with adolescent males who have sexual abuse issues. Um, he said that he's ran across a couple of those cases in the past years, and they seem to have extreme anger issues in addition to those with their substance abuse issues. Um, I, I, what I've found helpful with cases like that is, is like being able to model and embody empathy, open exploration, and just like ro rolling with it. And if they're not willing to talk about it, if they're not willing to go there, being able to engage them in a conversation in something they like. Uh, something they enjoy, and is establishing the relationship first, and then naturally that stuff starts coming about, and their anger I've seen melt away because they find they can establish trust. It's trust first, and then empathic and, and open listening. You know, being able to sort of say, "Yeah, I would be angry too if I were in your, were in your shoes," and that's a really difficult situation. I, I've seen it work across the board. It, it seems simple. It seems uh, you know too simple, but that that's what I've seen be highly effective is is engagement, relationship first. You don't push too hard at first and then just being able to help them openly explore their issues. OK, I don't know if you can recall this off the top of your head, but, but we have Davia, who's asking if you can give the name of the ENDR specialist one more time. Um, now I'm blanking. I'm <laughs> sorry. No um, problem. We can always, if that's included in the presentation, they'll get that information in the, in the PDF and the PowerPoint that we send out to them afterwards. Yeah, and if they go to emdr.com, her name is all over that website. So um, I, I apologize. I'm just on the spot. I blinked. No problem. OK, well, it looks like we've concluded our question and answer session for today. We appreciate everyone dialing in. And as I mentioned, when you log off, if you could please take the survey that appears on your screen, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. And if you have the chance, we have one more webinar next Thursday, September 27th at 1 PM. Thanks and we'll be logging off the webinar now.